but uh, but did your journalistic experience give you access to the police? I mean, you write the police stuff so well. Do you just imagine it, or have you well, actually gone in and worked it uh, out with them? That's mostly what I did for a good part of my career was crime. Uh, I did it in Miami, and I did it in uh, in uh, St. Paul. Toward the end of my career, when I knew I was already starting to write books, and I knew probably I wanted to do that for a long time, and and uh, and I was starting to burn out on journalism, I began. Through most of my career, I devised my own uh, assignments because they're usually as good as what the editors could think of anyway. I edited for a while. I knew how their minds worked. Uh, and I devised a whole series of, of, of assignments that would get me places that I wanted to see. So I spent a couple months in Stillwater State Penitentiary, and because of the nature of the assignment, I wound up talking most of the killers. Uh, and I got to know 20 killers pretty well. Um, I spent uh, a couple of months doing medical stories in the emergency room. Uh, so I watched people coming into the emergency room all the time. Uh, I did a number of crime stories, uh, both out state, I mean, out of the metro area and, and locally, just to watch how the cops work. Uh, well, they feel so real that, you know, my sense was that you had been there, done that, and that, you know, you were in a, not, not reporting, you know. But, but there is a very distinct difference between, between what you write in thrillers and, and the way the police work, the closest are probably Ed McBain's 82nd Precinct thrillers. Right. But a thriller has its own dynamic. Uh, you know, it has a plot that really pulls it too hard, and you have to wind things around that. And police don't really work like that. In this latest book, uh, Davenport is doing this pretty intensive investigation, but then Saturday and Sunday comes, and everybody takes the weekend off, and he goes out and buys a suit. Um, and that's sort of the way police work works. I mean, I, I could, you can't do that completely in a thriller because then you lose the forward motion right. of the book. But, uh, but you know, cops take the weekends off. Even sure. if they're working on a heavy case, they, uh, they, they just do, st you know, they just do strange things happen. And isn't the there, I mean, they're usually working more than one case too, right? right. So you yeah. don't get that, you know, absolutely intense focus. You don't focus. get that focus on it that, that you get in a thriller. That, that really is required for a thriller. Absolutely. I wanted to, when you were here last year, you have an acquaintance who is at the Arizona Republic, Steve Wilson, I guess that he was your editor? Right. He worked with us in uh, St. Paul. And he wrote a very nice article about you in the Republic last year, but he said something that I particularly liked, which if you don't mind, or even if you do, <laughs> I'm briefly going to read. But what I respect most about Camp, says Steve, is his determination to get to the core of the story. Ellie Wiesel said most journalism falls short because it is concerned with the fleeting moment, the most dramatic, the most visible, not the underlying reasons. While journalists serve up a lot of information, what's most essential is usually missed. And then he goes on to say that you understand that. And I thought when I read that, I thought that was really true. That was why I like your books. Well, uh, it always seemed to me in journalism that, that uh, I mean, I did all the stuff that all other journalists do. I mean, I covered tornado stories and I covered uh, uh, you know, just routine, you know, shootings outside of a bar someplace where uh, essentially nobody really cared too much about what happened. I mean, the guy who got shot is a long time drunk and, and kind of loser, and the guy who shot him is a, is a identical right. case, and one of them goes to prison, and one of them goes into the grave, and who cares? I mean, it's just sort of that attitude. Um, but there always is like a much more complicated reality and a story under that, which I always found more interesting. I was always fascinated by people. Uh, to get out of the crime area, I was always fascinated by people who are craftsmen uh, mm. because they always seem to be doing something uh, that was beyond just kind of the surface glitz of the culture we live in. I mean, you know, people make violins, for example, sure. or, or, or I wrote a book, a, a nonfiction book on plastic surgery, and one of the reasons I did it was because the, uh, the plastic surgeon involved seemed to me to be an artist. I mean, he just... I mean, he, wow. did, he did all kinds of, of microsurgery. I, I actually got to watch an 11-hour long operation in which he took a, a little boy's uh, second toe off and built him a thumb from it uh, because he'd, the kid had lost a thumb in a, uh, in a log splitting accident when the log splitter came back and cut mm -hmm. his thumb off. If you lose your thumb, you've lose, lost about half of your use of your hand. Sure. So they built a new thumb from it. But what he really liked to do was nose jobs, rhinoplasties, because hey. he was such an artist at it. And I mean, he had, and he had thought about it for so long, and he was so good. It's a very sensitive kind of thing to do, but you bet. but he was he was so good at it uh, that it was just interesting talking because that was it was just like this really nice. Well, I suppose nice it's sculpture craft. in a way. I mean, it would yeah. be like talking to Phidias or something. You know, you drop back to ancient Rome. And I and or I, al Greece. I also did a book on on uh, uh, watercolor with a guy named John Stuart Ingle, who was a watercolorist, 
of fantastic watercolors and an intellectual who had this who had this really interesting kind of philosophical rationale for uh, for behind his watercolors and 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 talking to him about that and then seeing the painting simultaneously is just that sounds fascinating. Yeah. I didn't realize you had written nonfiction. I mean, just those, those two books. Those right. two books. Could you tell us? We just have a couple minutes left. A little bit about your two John Camp books and the upcoming one. Well, they were my first, the first thriller novels that I wrote. Uh, and actually, what happened was that I wrote, uh, I wrote a, I wrote a thriller novel, and I sent it to Carl Hyacin's agent because Hyacin was already published. And I said, "Give me your agent's name," and so he gave it to her. I sent her the book. She sent it back. She said she really couldn't, she really couldn't get this published because there were some serious problems with it. The writing was fine but I didn't know how to plot, and I really didn't know anything about the market. So then I began writing another book, and this one had a lot of social commentary in it, and I got about 50,000 words into it, and I realized I was gonna have to throw 40,000 away and just write a straight thriller, which I did. And she sold it for not very much money, but then she explained to me that I could make a lot more money if I would write a more complicated novel. Uh, and then she explained to me sort of what I had to do, and then I did that, and that turned into the first Davenport novel. But I had a contract to write two of the camp novels, the, the, the two of the novels about a guy named Kid, who was a computer hacker. Uh, so what happened was that, uh, was that when Putnam bought the Davenport novel, they said they were going to do a big advertising campaign, and they didn't want the other company, Henry Holt, writing on their advertising campaign with these two smaller kid novels, one of which I'd written and one of that I was contracted to write. And so that's when, the da that's when the Sanford name got invented. Is that your grandfather? Yes, that's my grandfather's name, and my great-grandfather's name. And, and uh, so then, so it's just purely like a brand name. And my name is in the back of the books. My real name is in the back of the books. And, uh, but these two kid novels were really kind of ahead of their time. They're about a computer hackers, uh, hmm. you know, attacking different computer installations uh, purely on the line. They destroy a company doing it in one of the books. Um, what they fools um, fools run fools run right and what was the other one uh, the Empress file they're all named after tarot cards and the one coming up this fall is called the Devil's Code and uh, it's set actually mostly in Dallas and Waco Texas very interesting and since Putnam's doing it maybe they'll wind up putting Sanford John Sanford or what John it's Camp writing is John Sanford no, it's gonna be or just, just John, John Sanford, Sanford. Yeah. I find that so interesting the way they go well that sounds I'm, I'm delighted because I, we've always enjoyed the camp novels and they were not available for a while and people used to come in and ask for them so well I hope I'm, they like this one I, mm. I really do too this has really been a pleasure I wish we had another hour <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for having me oh I hope you will come back and we could discuss archaeology yeah. at depth thank you very much and I certainly thank all of you for joining us on this episode of the criminal calendar and it would